Hey y'all, new day, new verses. Let's dig in to 15 through 16 and then 17 through 18. Here we go. If you confuse others by making a big issue over what they eat or don't eat, you're no longer a companion with them in love, are you? These remember our persons for whom Christ died. Would you risk sending them to hell over an item in their diet? Don't you dare let a piece of God blessed food become an occasion of soul poisoning. You know, and I think it's rather poignant that we dig into here for a minute to just think about the fact that if we look at the wrong issue, the stumbling could be damning. If we look at a fight that makes absolutely no sense, especially one when we're supposed to be living in love, and we cause people to fall off the tracks, to fall away, then what are we doing? If we fall, or cause people by our actions to walk away from God, are we Christian to begin with? I know it's not always easy, and yeah, there is the agency of each one of us is responsible for our own actions. At the same time, why would any of us want to make it worse? Paul himself, Paul himself says that. We talked about it earlier. You know, and as he continues into 17 and 18, God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach, for goodness sake. It's what God does with your life as he sets it right, puts it together, and completes it with joy. Your task is to single-mindedly serve Christ. Do that and you'll kill two birds with one stone, pleasing the God above you and proving your worth to the people around you. you know, and I think it's interesting that it's kind of the other side of love God, love others. Because we shouldn't necessarily be interested in the, you know, well, they say I'm worth it, and they say I'm worth it. We're not supposed to get our approval from people. It's the order of operations. If we're serving Christ, truly serving Christ, living as he did. Examples of when I was hungry, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you, or when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you came and visited. When I needed a place to stay, you gave me shelter. Offering love, mercy, sacrifice, compassion, consideration, kindness, generosity, truth. They're more than just words. They're choices. A choice to be true to oneself. To have one's yes mean yes. A choice to agape others. To show agape. A choice of love. To say, well, yeah, I'm aware of it. But I made my choice. I choose to love. Because... God primes it right there. Paul writes it right there. Task is to single-mindedly serve Christ. Okay, so it's like, well, doesn't that make it? No. Because if you're single-mindedly serving Christ, you're living with love. If you're single-mindedly serving Christ and living a life that echoes His, then you're offering mercy over sacrifices. And sacrifices can be a positive or a negative. I think all too often there has been a sacrifice of people on the altar of religion. And that's not okay. Least of all, if we're to follow our king and our king got down on his knees and washed his disciples' feet, died for us, raised to life for us. And if that's, that's what Christ's life looks like, the one who is both truly human and truly God, if that's what his life looks like, oh, I want to live like that, man. I, I want to live a life that says, I'm not interested in me. How can I show his love to you? So I think part of living a Christ-centered life is embracing the fact that Christ made us who we are. That He is the one who shapes us. That He is the one who makes us who we are supposed to be. Right there in the Word. 
what God does with our lives as he sets our lives right, fixes the injustices, helps us with these difficulties, heals us. And it may not always look the way we want it to, but it will be the kind we need. Now, I'll give you an example from my own life. I used to be a very angry person. I didn't like anyone or anything, least of all myself. I was angry. I was hateful. I couldn't stand existence. And in trusting God, although He may not have completely physically healed me yet, He has been spiritually and emotionally healing me. Wounds that I would dare say are far deeper. But that's the beauty of it. That He sets it right. That He puts it together. That He completes what it's supposed to look like. And does so with joy. Teaching us how to rejoice. You know, I know that it may seem odd. It's an upside down kingdom for a reason. It does look different. But imagine if we lived in that kind of difference. Embraced that kind of difference. We have an example in our culture to pay it forward. You know, oh, somebody paid for my latte, let me pay for the next person in the lines, kind of idea. That little bit of generosity goes a long way, right? So, now let's, let's try and add this to a different kind of thing. Same idea, bigger equation. What if we were to pay forward the gift we were given? The gift we could never earn. No matter what we did, now, how we did it, a gift we could never earn. Then again, that's what makes it a gift, no? So, we've got this way of doing things. Christ loves us. Christ's love for us. That he would live, die, and be raised to life for us. And what if we paid that forward? What if we paid the mercy forward? that looks at a woman caught red-handed violating the law of Moses and said, where are your accusers? Well, I don't see them either. Go and sin no more. What if we offered the kind of love that says, well, yeah, they're not perfect, but they're my family. Because whether you look at it through evolution, Noah, Adam and Eve, take your pick really, it's a closed system, no? So then, every single one of us is a sibling. Perhaps very, very, very far removed, but a sibling nonetheless. So, if they are. And in living a life that is perpetuating the largest sibling rivalry in history, we play a game. And it's a game of who can get to the top of the totem pole faster. But what's the point of being at the top of the pole when you can never help those below you? You're merely standing on their shoulders. Hey, bird. Embrace the beauty of life. Embrace the beauty that He gives. We don't have to go to war with each other in this knockdown drag out. We can live a Christ centered life. And a Christ centered life says, I don't want to play by the dog eat dog rules. I don't want to play to win the rat race game. I don't want to play the my etc. is bigger than your etc. game, to give an example. I would rather play, or rather, live by the actual way of doing it. Because there are many games, you know, and I, I could go into them, I, I could make a comment about fiat currency not having a gold back, I'm not, I don't care. I really don't, because it's all the same game. But what isn't a game? 
well, life and death, that's, that's got a bit more real to it. True life and death, soul life and death, now that's a bit more. So, something where your very existence is on the line, and the choice is to love. To accept Christ's love. Because if we could do it on our own, self-help wouldn't be a billion dollar in your industry. Humanity would still not be butchering each other to this day. And however long the timeline you want to look at it, be it the creationist 5,000 years or the... Um, sorry, Earth was 14.5 billion human... 100,000? Sorry, my background's in, in uh, geology, not evolution. But look, the point... The more years we've had, the worse we look. So there's got to be something missing. And Christ says that the thing that is missing is the God in us, letting the Holy Spirit in, not being left grieving, but being made whole. And that, well, that requires relationship. There's, if you want God to change you and just poof well that's not worshipping God that's rubbing a lamp and asking a genie for five bucks kind of thing and God is not a genie that is part of the surrender is trusting God to do it his way <laughs> it's not always the easiest thing to do but then again is trusting in a relationship the easiest thing to do is trusting a significant other the easiest thing to do? How much more difficult is it to trust the invisible but ever-present God? I'm not saying it's easy in any way, shape, or form. Anyone who tells you that's either lying, selling something, or has had a radical encounter that we don't all get. But at the core of it, Letting God set it right. Trusting Him to put it together, to complete us with joy, to complete us in His joy, so that we can, as Paul says, rejoice, and again I will say, rejoice in Philippians. Seems like a great place to start celebrating to me. Celebrate the fact that we are loved. Celebrate the fact that even though we face difficulties, we're never alone. We're not. Even in the darkest moments, we're not alone. And in truth, I have found that in the darkest places, when we are emptiest, is when God can get closest to us. Because we already have an understanding of it, even though we don't, may not know we do in English. It's called being full of yourself. If you're full of yourself, how can God pour in? If you're full of other, how can God pour in? It requires a life that wants Him. To let Him set the way of doing it. Not others, not ourselves, but Him. And when Christ was asked, what is the most important commandment? He quoted the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.5, and Leviticus, I think it's 11.22. Love the Lord your God with all of your will, all of your purpose, and all of your muchness. And love others as you yourself are loved. seems pretty straightforward and in truth it is it is simple yet profound I found that most truth in life is simple yet profound BS is shallow and complex you know and, and pardon the bluntness I know that not every preacher is going to call it like this I, I I'll happily own that I'll happily own that I'm a little different But I do so not because I want to be a different type of person, not because I want to be a pain in the tuchus for anybody, not because I want anyone to stumble. I do it because I rejoice that God made me, me, 
that He will complete me how He wants me, as long as I surrender to Him. Because a life completely surrendered to Him is His complete responsibility. And if you want to see that that looks like, put him to the test. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. That is not about the external. It's not about what you put into your stomach. Jesus himself said it is not what goes into a person's mouth, but what comes out of it that defiles them. So what if we take that idea and combine it with this verse? I'm pretty sure it was the idea he was pulling from anyway. If we're living a life that loves God, then what's going to come out of us is love for others. If we truly agape others, a mature, adult love that says, I know there can be a pain in my tukas. I know that they may not be doing the smartest thing or the wisest thing, but I'm going to love them anyway. Well, now that's going to look slightly different, wouldn't it? That's going to feel slightly different, isn't it? So, if we are to live a life that embraces the fact that we are God's masterpiece, that He is shaping us into who He wants us to be, that He is taking out of us the parts that we don't want anyway, when He takes the anger from an angry person, when he takes the pain from a broken person, when he takes the sadness from a lost person, and when he feels it, fills it, overflows it with joy, hope, truth, embracing his justice, his love, his mercy, well then suddenly the armor of God is not something to go into war against other people. It's how we dress ourselves to deal with principalities and spirits. To deal with out there. As we welcome him in, sorry, in here. <laughs> as we welcome him into our hearts. Because that kind of relationship is going to have a fundamental effect. And if it's a fundamental effect, a relationship based on love, in love, with the person who is love, then suddenly disdain has no room in the heart. Hate has no place in the soul. And even when we experience moments of those things, we can rejoice because the valley will come and go. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you can bet your ass I won't camp here. So we don't have to. We can let him walk us through. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. He will make us lie down in green pastures. He will give us a place to rest our heads. Not because of anything we've done, but because it is exactly who he is. And we trust Him to be who He says He is. The I Am. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Or as the name He gave Moses, He is. Well, I guess Etia is He is. Etia is I Am. Yahweh is He is. But He is the I Am. He will take care of it. I am comforter. I am the healer. I am the redeemer. I am the judicator. I am the one who brings justice, says the Lord. So embrace it. Don't worry about fighting a battle that wasn't yours to fight. God will tell you where to go. He will place you where He wants you to be. It's all about trusting and listening. And that is the core of any relationship to listen, and to trust. Something that I hope we are able to do. Because we were given a gift. One we did not earn, one we could not earn, and one that all we have to do is receive it. So let us. Let us embrace the fact that God will set it right. 
He is, after all, Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees to it. Yahweh, who sees to it. So, test him. Let him prove himself to do it. Don't tempt him, but that's a lesson for another day. Trust in the Lord, because he's not going to let you go. And no matter where we go, we can't escape an omnipresent God. So, better to at least be sure as to where we stand after getting to know Him. Because if you've got a relationship with Him and you still don't want Him, that's a choice. But if you've never known Him, never known that love, never known that compassion, never known that mercy, never known that truth, then how do you know? Give it a try. See. Seek. And you shall find. Knock. And the door will be opened. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow for verses... Uh, let me get them right here. <laughs> 19 through 21. My apologies. See you guys tomorrow for verses 19 through 21. May his favor be upon you. And be blessed. Because you are more loved than you know. And you are never alone. See you then.